Yorana, bonjour. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the eighth and final panel of South Pacific Islander Organizations Virtual Summit. This panel is on careers in arts, culture, and storytelling. My name is Marushka Hershon. I am one of SPIO's co-founders, and I'm really excited to uh, host this particular panel because Growing up, I actually wanted to become a filmmaker. It was something that, um, an industry that some of my family was in, not only in the islands, but also in the US. And I actually have family members who are in the film industry in Tahiti for actors or producers. And that was always something that interested me, especially growing up in the US where the media was heavily dominated by non-Pacific voices. When I got into college, I actually wanted to do film, uh, but Unfortunately, there wasn't quite a community of Pacific presence. So I didn't feel like it was an inviting space. So now to have the opportunity um, later on in my career to participate in a panel like this is, is really incredible. So I'm really honored. And just to give a little background on SPIO, we are a new and 100% volunteer-led nonprofit dedicated to democratizing Pacific Islander access to educational and career resources. So we've been listening to the needs of current scholars and we decided to focus our first summit this weekend uh, broadly on building sustainable pathways for Pacific Islanders in higher education and professional fields. And essentially a big vision of ours is to see Pacific Islander scholars on a path to economic freedom and a big part of that is simply being aware of your educational and career options. So with that in mind, this panel once again is on arts and storytelling and oftentimes careers in this area can seem difficult to attain. So during this hour, we will get to hear a bit about our panelists, their lines of work. They'll get to talk about general tips on entering into their career field and talk about ways to support Pacific artists and storytellers. After addressing these questions, we'll then go into a live Q&A session. So if anyone in the audience has questions, please feel free to ask them in the comment section throughout the panel. Now, before jumping into our questions, I'll ask each panelist to introduce themselves. And along with your intro, as an icebreaker, please share your biggest storytelling inspiration or role model, starting with Dagmar Beck. Uh, Marule, everyone. My name's Dagmar Dyke. I am a first generation New Zealander and a first gen generation university graduate living and working in Tamaki Makoto, Aotearoa, Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, my father, Dieter, was born in Danzig, Germany, today Gdansk, Poland. So I have German, Dutch, and Polish ancestry on my father's side. And my mother, Seneca, was born in Utunake, Vava Otonga. So on her father's side, I'm from the Wolfgrams and on my mother's, her mother's side, um, the Himaloto family. So I'm married to my husband, Lyle, who is Tuhoi. We have three gorgeous teenage children. Um, but my current role here, I'm the senior leader and arts teacher at Sylvia Park School. Uh, the children in our school range, range from the ages of five to 12 years old. Our role is over 530 students and the most prominent communities are Māori, Pacifica and Indian. Um, I have several art heroes or elders that I've called on for, for their critical, and they've been critical in teaching, healing and expertise um, in survival and resistance. So one of my longest standing mentors and elders is Samoan um, artist Fatu Fe'u. He has been a constant support from my university days and he's never left my side. He has shown me that artists are the windows to their own cultures. If they fail, then their communities fail. And our esteemed Tongan knowledge holder, Lady Dowager Tuna Fialakepa, where she has taught me the most important thing in life is our relationship and connection with people. And with this, there must be warmth. You can know it in your head, but it is in your heart that matters. Malo. Thank you so much, Dagmar. Carlo, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, buona tuna and malo lele, everybody. Um, I'm Galolaine Yutrij Fainu. Um, I'm coming to this call and this dialogue from um, Kokopo in East New Britain, Papua New Guinea. Um, this is the um, land that, where my mother was born um, and my father is uh, Tongan. 
Um, I am the founding director for uh, Pacifica Film Fest. Um, Pacifica Film Fest is a film festival that celebrates um, Pacifica stories, um, specifically stories made by Pacific people, um, so our stories in, in our own voices. Um, my biggest storytelling uh, inspiration actually just comes from um, my family and, and my culture. Um, I grew up listening to the stories of my um, grandfather that he would he would just constantly tell um, about this far, far away land in Papua New Guinea and, and living on a plantation. And it would always conjure up all these um, wonderful um, imaginings of, of, you know, this land that I felt so much was a part of my life, but was so also so disconnected in, in a lot of ways growing up in, in Australia. So um, the story that he did and that my, my aunties and uncles and um, did was a big part of forming my my own desire to become a storyteller as well. Um, uh, I also, because of growing up, you know, in, in Australia, I, I was, I had this sense of, you know, disconnection to, to the land and the places and the culture and the languages um, that were, that all belonged to my ancestors and, and also belonged to me. And so storytelling um, was a way of reconnecting to all of those things and it, it became my passport to, to go and discover and learn and, and better understand um, me and, and where I came from. Next, we have Victoria Wansawit. Salo Falaba, my name is Victoria, and I am a senior at the University of Hawaii. I am studying Pacific Island Studies with a concentration in culture, arts, and performance. Um, I also am representing Oceanic Art Collective. For those who have not heard of us yet, um, we are an active page, mostly on Instagram and Facebook, where we use our page as a space for Pacifica artists to um, basically share their artwork and network with one of each, well, and network with each other. So we mostly, it's basically a page ran by Pacific Island artists for Pacifica artists. Um, I guess I'm also a self-taught digital artist. So one of my inspirations, um, honestly, my favorite artist would have to be Rina Noriega. Um, she is um, of, I say Dominican. She is Dominican, um, but I love her artwork just because it speaks um, a lot on women empowerment and so on and so forth. But I'm also inspired by a lot of my other peers that I've met along my way during my journey um, running OAC. So there's that. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us today. And finally, we have Dr. Mary Therese Prez Hattori. Hafade and Aloha. Uh, also um, attended the University of Hawaii. I actually uh, completed a Bachelor's of Education in Secondary Social Studies with a focus on Pacific history, uh, a Master's in Educational Technology, and a Doctorate in Professional Educational Practice. Uh, I'm currently working at the East West Center in Honolulu as a scholarship specialist. I'm a lecturer and affiliate graduate faculty uh, in several departments at the University of Hawaii. I am originally from the island of Guam, a native Chamorro, uh, one of nine children. I think some of my nieces and nephews are online watching, so hop it um, And uh, my mom is Fermina Leongaro Perez. My dad was Paul Mitsuo Hattori, and our clan is Familian Titang. And my um, biggest inspiration uh, as a storyteller was my grandfather. Um, Joaquin Cruz Perez, Guam's first Chamorro uh, judge, Chief Justice of the Superior Court of Guam. He was a, a great uh, leader, uh, an elder in our community. He was a carpenter. He raised chickens. Um, not only was he a great storyteller, but he viewed his job as a judge, um, particularly in family court, as a way to let others tell their stories. And in family court, he tried hard to make space, safe spaces for youth and their family um, to share those stories. And he transmitted that, that um, sense of this sort of a moral imperative to make opportunities and safe spaces for others to tell their stories uh, for voices that are often ignored or silenced. And I think he transmitted that to uh, all of his children and grandchildren. So he's my biggest inspiration. Thank you. Thank you all for your beautiful introductions, for sharing um, your inspirations. Wow. I would love to jump into our panel questions. 
starting with, can you each tell us what you're doing in the field of arts and storytelling and how you got there? Starting with Dagmar. Okay, cool. Um, firstly, I'm just going to rephrase slightly your question because I'm going to remove the end. Um, as a Pacifica artist, I believe art is storytelling. They are interlinked and completely connected to one another. I see that in the way in which we create our arts and the spaces in which we tell them. So my Tongan ethnicity has played a fundamental role in the way I see and relate to the world. Uh, throughout my schooling years, I never had a teacher who reflected me, nor did I have conversations with teachers who, who um, about my exact identity and experience that made me feel culturally invisible. However, through deliberate actions of my art teachers, they recognised the creative capacity in me. They encouraged me to use my art as a platform to, and vehicle to tell my story. And the rest is history. My arts career spans some 30 years. Uh, throughout the stretch of time, I've maintained a regular exhibiting program, both through solo and group exhibitions. Um, in the early 90s, I studied four years of undergrad in fine arts at Auckland University, majoring in printmaking. I completed one through the year of postgrad and left to pursue a full-time career as an artist. My art has taken me across this country and around the world through participating in exhibitions, workshops, conferences, art summits, and most recently, a three-year Auckland University Marsden-funded research project where I have been part of a small team of investigators exploring 18th and 19th century Tongan artefacts and their legacies. Ten years ago, I um, spent a year completing my graduate diploma in teaching at Victoria University. My decision to enter the teaching profession was propelled by a couple of factors. One being my youngest child was to start school and I was ready to relook at my career options. And secondly, the influence and actions of teachers in my life were critical. I wanted to be able to give back and empower the next generation of artists and creatives. Last year, I was awarded a year sabbatical where I um, completed my master's in professional studies and education at Auckland University. Through my personal experience and story, my research sought to question the ongoing invisibility of Pacifica arts and artists in our arts curriculum, therefore exposing the ongoing inequities and systemic racism in our education system. In the professional sense, I play the juggling game between my arts practice and my teaching practice, but there is an intersection there, and because of that, I enjoy being able to leverage in both sectors. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that there is this intersection with your job and your passions, that it is possible. I think it's so important to hear that. Thank you for sharing. Next, we have Carlo. Okay. Um, I guess so for me, uh, uh, for many years, I've been working um, as a facilitator um, uh, through the Pacifica Film Fest platform, um, creating spaces for um, other Pacifica storytellers to um, have a space, have a platform to be able to share um, their films. Um, and But not only the film side of things, what we've been able to do over the years since we've um, established the festival is to create spaces where storytellers can come together and connect. Um, we've done uh, pitching forums and competitions. We, we run some 48-hour film challenges where we invite, um, uh, you know, creatives to come together and do some workshopping. So, is, you know, share ideas and then at the end of it come up with a film. Um, and so all of these things have been a really nice way to um, engage and, and connect with um, uh, other storytellers. And so for a long time um, I've been just working sort of in more in the facilitating kind of role. Um, but more recently I have been um, trying to step back more into the creative role as well. Um, uh, at the moment, um, or over the last uh, year and a half, I've been working on, on producing a documentary film, which is kind of how I found myself um, here in, back in Papua New Guinea. Um, it all came about after um, my grandmother passed in 2018, and our family had always had plans to bring uh, both the ashes of both my grandparents back to family mutmut or cemetery here um, and a long-standing history here so it was all the always their wishes to come back and when we started to make those plans for them to come back I put my hand up straight away and said look I, I'm happy to be the on the on the ground coordinator of of the event and a cultural like a liaison between the the, the community family back in Australia and at the same time I saw a wonderful opportunity to to document and and to tell this story and um, 
you know, put it all together and bring it back to life. And so that's what I've been working on um, at the moment. So still doing the film festival stuff, um, working on creative stuff. Um, and, you know, as, as many creatives, I, we always have many skills um, and, and thing, different multiple projects happening at the same time. So, you know, I, I, I'm, I freelance here in, in PNG. Um, I continue to, to write and create and um, create content for, you know, um, various little media platforms and, and get involved in lots of community-based projects um, here in the islands. Carlo, it's amazing because you saw a need and that people needed to be connected in this space. And not only are you navigating this creative space as a facil facilitator, like creating the space, you're actually working to do that, but then you're also navigating cre creating um, your art as well. So I think that's that's really powerful and important work and we need more people like you building these spaces. So thank you. Next we have Victoria. So I'm actually going to start as to like how we got to where we are as OAC. Um, growing up, I believe this could be related to, relatable to a lot of people. Um, art wasn't really seen as a liable or stable career in most Pacifico families. A lot of our parents pushed us to wanting to become doctors, lawyers, and not all of us, you know, were given the talent to, you know, do things. We were born doing other things. So for us as OAC, you know, representatives and as artists, we um, we found our niche through drawing, whether it was through visual art or performing art, um, although our fo main focus is visual art. So what we're doing now, as I mentioned earlier, is give a space for Pacifica artists to um, allow us to promote their artwork and share artwork with other people who admire art by Pacifica artists, and it doesn't have to um, necessarily, you know, be confined into, you know, a Pacific artist doing mostly Pacific art, such as, you know, like traditional, of what you're looking at. We're trying to um, encourage people to explore other areas of art, um, other than, I'm sorry, my Siri is going off, other than, you know, just sticking strictly to doing tribal tattoos or you know, tribal patterns or anything like that. We want them to explore, you know, comics. You know, a lot of our young Pacifica um, people are into anime and everything like that. And a lot of them want to get into animation as well. And so we want to encourage them to try out different styles and everything like that. So we've created that space to get in touch with other artists so that they can connect and talk and they maybe be mentored by them. So that way they can develop their skill as aspiring artists. That's great. Very much like Kahlo, you saw a need to create a community and, you know, leveraging the existence of this community and this desire to give back and connect. I think it's amazing. And also, thank you for kind of talking about the more practical side of can I make a living off this? Like you are trying to create space to make sure that there are avenues for aspiring, aspiring creatives to make a true living out of their passion. Next, we have Mary. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I guess I'll start with um, uh, what I'm doing now in the arts. I am uh, one of the uh, co-founders uh, of the um, annual Cultural Animation Film Festival uh, in discussions with uh, Michael Q. Ceballos, the CEO of Twiddle Productions, um, also the producer of uh, a beautiful animated film that was, uh, it's called Misa, the Chamorro Girl Who Saved Guahan, all in Chamorro with English subtitles. Um, in conversations, we, we came to the realization that many animators, particularly those working in cultural animation, rarely have venues to share their work. And so uh, in conversations with the Cultural Animators Network, uh, Michael and the, the Doris Duke Theater, Taylor Chang, um, we launched the Cultural Animation Film Festival. Uh, we actually now have uh, on August 8th, um, a cultural animation film festival for kids. So it's CAF for Kids featuring animated films for children and, and made by uh, kids, many, many from Hawaii. And so uh, our, our regular uh, cultural animation film festival will be in uh, mid-September and we're going virtual for, for both of these events, which is really nice. Uh, so it's been really inspiring to, to see all of the beautiful cultural animation that's out there. 
uh, and to see all of the, the richness of, of our, our cultures and to meet so many wonderful filmmakers. Uh, I'm also uh, one of the organizers of the annual Celebrate Micronesia Festival in Hawaii, where we uh, uplift and celebrate the beautiful heritages of the people of all of the Micronesian uh, islands who are in uh, Greater Micronesia, who are in uh, Hawaii. And uh, thanks to the Bishop Museum, uh, who was our host last year, we've decided to go virtual, and that will be on uh, October 24th. And so we're getting that that ready, and that's uh, going to be really exciting, uh, particularly since Micronesians in Hawaii, particularly those from the Kofa nations, face a great deal of discrimination uh, and systemic racism. Uh, and, and not just in Hawaii, but in, in other places, Guam and uh, the continental United States. And so this is a great opportunity to um, share the, the richness of our cultures with uh, Hawaii and now with the world since we're, we're online. And um, uh, so I'm looking forward to both of those. Uh, it's been very busy as we, we get ready for that. And I hope uh, many of the uh, people watching us today will, will mark, save those dates uh, for CAF for Kids on August 8th and then um, October 24th, the Celebrate Micronesia Festival. I actually, um, like uh, Dagmar, I um, believe that as a Pacific Islander, uh, actually many of us don't even have the word art in our, in our languages. And it's, we are art, our culture is our art. Uh, just by being, we are practicing our art. So I like to think that my, um, uh, that art and my culture are infused uh, in my uh, leadership, in my teaching, in my scholarship. Uh, I actually try to use arts-informed methodologies, indigenous methodologies in, in my work, and um, actually got started as, a, as an artist, as a poet, um, thanks to Carlo Mila, who uh, was a, um, in Hawaii. Uh, she was a Fulbright creative uh, New Zealand Pacific um, uh, recipient and she had, did a residency in Hawaii. And what I what one of the things that, that Carlo did for me and for many others was she she um, would create spaces. She was renting this fabulous place in Manoa and would have lots of gatherings for different creative people. And in one of her first gatherings, um, I was a total fangirl, right? So in awe of Carlo, uh, she said, "Come to this party. There will be a lot of mostly Pacific Pacific Islanders." Uh, all writers and um, all, most of them published uh, writers, uh, poets, artists. Um, and she said, but the one rule is, Mary, if you come, you have to, and she does to everyone, if you come, you have to recite a poem, you have to share a poem. I was so uh, nervous, uh, but that forced me, because I'm, I'm a rule, rule follower, so it forced me to, for the first time ever, to actually share poetry uh, with others. And the feedback from my colleagues, my friends, uh, the other Pacifica poets in the room was so empowering and so heartwarming. Uh, and then that just, the ball, you know, was just rolling from there and uh, started submitting work and then uh, asking, uh, people started asking for me to submit work into collections. So I really owe a debt of gratitude to Carlo. And I share the story because I think we can all do this for others, do this for aspiring artists and make spaces and give other people the opportunity to share in a variety of ways, informal and formal. I'm just taken aback by just the, the rich answers that each one of you have, has given us. And I think it ties in really well with the second question, which is, do you have tips for aspiring artists and storytellers uh, to try to make a sustainable career out of that passion. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I've got a few bullet points, um, but then I'm going to expand on my last one and give an example of, of what we're doing here in Aotearoa. So I guess for me, and possibly because often we are the minority in most of our spaces where, you know, that, that feeling of being invisible is a real thing, I would just say stay authentic. Um, stand in your truth because when you're standing in your truth no one can take that away from you so that's really powerful be bold in telling your stories so it's about being courageous in those spaces it's really easy to say it I know that but um, you do have to dig somewhere and that that place of courage is really important I'd say working collaboratively is really important so partnering up with others 
um, if you've got gaps in your practice or anything, um, so go out and seek to find partners that you can work with. Um, I've had mentors um, throughout my career and they've come in at really strategic places. Um, and so I think seeking a mentor, someone that you respect and admire is also a really good practice. And that is just Pacifica ways of doing things anyway. Diversifying, diversifying your practice as an artist. So um, whilst I majored in print, I'm a painter, I'm a weaver. Um, and I work and I like to, to push out and find other ways of storytelling. So diversifying your practice is really important. Um, embracing the hustle. Um, and for some of us, that might be where we might need to find that mentorship um, because the hustle is actually probably 75% of the job. Um, that's that's a big thing. Um, and keeping good records um, after 30 years as an artist, a professional artist, having a really good accountant and knowing having some good business acumen is actually a really, really good thing to do and start it early in your career. Um, and encourage and cheer each other on because my or your success is our success you know so that whole collectiveness that that working as a village is really really important and that's that's all um integral to who we are as a people so um those are some things so here in new zealand so Poli malama Felipe tohi and i so Felipe is our most senior male um artist here in new zealand we've formed a tongan arts collective called Nofaktaha. so that we have a loose membership um but we probably have about 20 core member artists it's very fluid um but we respond so I'm just going to show what that looks like what does a collective look like I know that there's other collectors on here so for us um, it's loose concept meaning is the concept of tying um, to a post or a wharf um, it's arts with tongue and blood ties so what's our mission what do we do we research create innovate inspire and challenge we share our stories teach, communicate and learn. We motivate, support, nurture and, facil and facilitate. We engage, present, showcase, curate, network and lead. How do we do it? We meet and travel. We create space and time, work together and collaborate. We have Faikava sessions, we share meals together. We push ourselves forward, use initiative in each other's strengths and practices. We call on our blood ties and our passion. We hustle and self-fund. We use social networking such as Facebook, marketing, promotion, word of mouth and exhibitions and festivals to sell our work and merchandise. Who do we do it for? Firstly, ourselves, but also for each other, our families, our Tongan communities in Tonga, New Zealand and around the world. We do it for God, the King and church, our children and youth, for teachers, the New Zealand and international art scenes, for art critics, curators and the arts in general, and for our ancestors. The value we bring, culture, family, diverse skill sets, unique voices both individually and collectively, quality, respect, opportunities, growth, friendships, a passion for the arts and culture, and to grow a legacy. Thank you. Maruru, you really shared, touched upon a lot of things that resonated with me. I think what really stood out was, you know, being bold and telling our stories. And as you mentioned, having collaboration as a big part of um, the work that we do and that your success is our success and that we just flourish together. And um, that's really beautiful. So thank you so much. Next, Kahlo, do you have any advice to share? Yeah, I mean, thank you, Dagmar, for um, really some <laughs> really concise and um, uh, very practical points there. Um, I agree with all of it. Um, um, and the collective sort of creativity, big tools that I, I use for myself as well. Um, and diversifying um, your skill setting and I kind of like the story that I wanted to share is, um, you know, it's utilizing your story storytelling skills in, in lots of different ways. I've found that to be really useful. Um, at uni, um, I did a, a master's course in media arts and production. And along the way, I, I, I just did lots of different things in the course. I, I didn't um, focus um, in on one particular area. And um, over the years, I have actually questioned my focus more in one area. I should become a real master in, in one area. But, um, you know, over the years, I've, I've come to um, really appreciate this sort of like having this broad range of skills and, you know, being the proverbial kind of jack of all trades, um, you know, not necessarily mastering 
any of those particular skills, but I, you know, I, I can write, um, I can shoot, I can, I can um, do stills and video, I can edit, I produce, I direct, I run events, I can, you know, run business, I know how to, you know, I picked up a whole lot of different skills um, and they all become really useful um, in, um, when trying to sustain your, your practice if you're trying to um, earn a living while still being passionate about doing um, your personal projects. And, you know, um, I think that's a great um, tool and asset to have to be able to be um, uh, flexible um, with your practice and, and, and be able to apply it across lots of different areas. Um, I think a good example is like while I've been in here in, in PNG, um, I, you know, I'm not on mainland PNG, I'm on an island um, that's about an, an hour and a half flight away from the mainland PNG and I, I would say that it's, it's a fairly remote little corner of the world and um, during the COVID lockdown, um, you know, at like everywhere, um, there was not a lot for people to do and you would have thought that, you know, not a lot of opportunity around but what actually happened for me is I actually... Um, ended up writing stories for The Guardian, for their Pacific section um, of, the, of the media agency. Um, I started pitching stories to them saying, hey, I'm here in PNG. Um, are you interested in hearing about our story and what's happening here on the ground? Um, and they were. So, you know, I think a big part is also um, having the confidence to reach out and, and pitch, know where you are and what you're doing and, and what you have access to. Um, at, at the same time, I was able to, by posting lots of sort of updates and stories and continually being creative, um, I was contacted by the World Bank um, who were looking for more content creators um, in Papua New Guinea. And so I think the other part of it is to be sustainable is to, to keep creating and to keep sharing and, and to, to be, even though you may feel like you're in this really isolated or remote part of, of the Pacific, um, your corner of the world is really interesting and, and there's a, something um, and what the digital world now gives us is an opportunity to work um, with anyone, anywhere, no matter where we where we are. And so um, stay visible um, with your practice as well. Yeah, you, you mentioned two things that once again really resonate with me. One, diversifying our skill set. And I think it's just innate, like where all of your multi-passionate, multi-talented, and it just seems like it's innate in our community. And I think that's really beautiful and important to shine a light on. And you mentioned reaching out to the media stations. And that's something that resonates so deeply with me. Um, sometimes you get a skewed view of the world and the representations of people. And so the fact that you reached out and like you said, you had the confidence to reach out to media stations and make sure that our voices are heard on these big platforms is, is great. And we need to keep on pushing to make sure that um, our voice is represented in all forms of media and art. Next, we have Victoria. So um, I think both have Dagmar and Carlo have made a really great point uh, with networking. Um, that is probably the biggest thing when it comes to like any 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 type of career, whether it's business or art. Um, there is no limit as to who you should network with. OAC, uh, we have connected with artists from all over the world. So we do have artists who are a part of our group uh, from New Zealand, Australia. Papua New Guinea as well, Samoa, Tonga, they come from all parts of throughout Oceania. And, you know, we do it because we love drawing. We love, we love sharing our artwork, uh, whether it is through our, you know, sharing it through our culture. And I love seeing it because, you know, being growing up Samoan, I've only been around, you know, Samoan culture, but being in a group like OAC, it's so diverse because then I get to see other artists and their culture. Um, I've never really seen anyone um, draw, uh, you know, Micronesian art the way um, Michaela does. She is um, a digital artist and she focuses mostly on Micronesian women and, and it's a beautiful thing. Um, one of the, so that's probably one of the biggest tips is to just network, you know, stay connected with people because it's, it, you create a relationship with each other. You guys have this um, in Samoa, what we call um, a ba, which is like a sacred space between you and your mentor or your peer or whoever it is. Um, another thing too, um, I guess, for people who are probably starting into the art career, 
don't look at, um, don't try and compare yourself to other people's artwork. Um, focus on how far you've come, the starting point. Look back at the starting point, how far you've come um, to where you are at now, and then continue to progress and develop your skills. You know, at OEC, we want to see more of that. We want to see people succeed in their art. And so, you know, we're offering workshops um, this, this month for anyone who is interested. And, you know, we would love for you guys to be a part of it. Um, another thing too, you know, since social media is such a huge way to, for um, a lot of artists to be active and network and so on and so forth, um, I think it's also important to take part of, of, of challenges, you know, certain challenges just to, um, you know, test your skills and so, and you know what I mean? But yeah, that's, that's probably most of the tips that I have to give to anyone that's watching. Yeah, I love what OAC is doing. I mean, your collective is, is so new. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's barely been, it's been less than a year. It feels like it's been less than a it's, year that it's been in existence. It's only been seven months. We oh, just, yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> and we're already creating this platform and leveraging social media and giving back by hosting workshops. I think it's incredible. And um, I hope people join your workshop and definitely mention it in the comments later so people can get to it. And then we have Mary. Wonderful tips. Uh, I have a few. Um, one of the the things um, that many artists face, many people face, is fear, right? So don't let your fear or your doubt hold you back. I could have, you know, that story about Carlo, I could have just not shown up, right? Um, but I didn't, and that changed everything for me. Um, artists accept all opportunities that are offered to you. When people ask you to submit a film for a festival, or a performance for a celebration, or a, an essay or a um, poem for a publication. Don't let your fear hold you back. Uh, many, many people in our community want our people to succeed, right? Your success, as Dagmar said, your individual success is the success of all of us. So there are many people who are out there willing to support artists. There are many people who uh, commission work. If someone asks you, uh, offers a commission, don't turn it down. Um, they're offering because they believe in you. And so uh, don't let any of those opportunities pass you by, uh, particularly if, if you're fearful, right? The opportunities are coming to you because you deserve them and because the world needs your work. My other tip is to remember that all of your art, whatever it is, in whatever form, tells a story. And it's very important, as all of our panelists have said, to be true to your own self and your own stories. In, in Chamorro, we have a, a saying, i irensha nalala i espirituta. Our heritage gives life to our spirit. Even those of us who are disconnected from our islands because of the diaspora, or who, like me, I came to Hawaii uh, for college and never left, right? You're far away from home and culture, but it's there's still ways to connect to your culture and then use your art uh, to reconnect, to, to strengthen your identity as an artist and to tell those stories. A uh, great example um, uh, of using our, our cultural stories as an artist, uh, I am wearing a lehulu, a feather lei from uh, Luffy Lutero of Papehi Creations. Luffy is a weaver. She weaves hats. Uh, she also makes uh, feather lei. Her hats, uh, the story she tells with her uh, Papale, her woven hats, is uh, the story of the Kumulipo, and all of her hats are connected to a wa or a chapter or a part of the Kumulipo. So she's got that story, and and that's sort of her design, um, the design behind a lot of her hats. And she so she uses the hats, the art, as a bridge to share this beautiful story and and indigenous wisdom with the rest of the world. Uh, the lehulu she designed for me, and used. Um, the uh, colors of the feathers of the Guam rail, which was an uh, uh, endangered bird. Um, I, I like to uh, tell people that I grew up uh, on Guam, uh, the generation of the silent jungle. Right? Can you imagine a jungle without bird song? Uh, due to changes in habitat, uh, issues with colonization, heavy militarization of our island, 
uh, there were no birds. I grew up, instead of hearing the song of birds, I heard the sound of the B-52 bombers that flew over our house repeatedly, very often because we lived in the north next to um, Anderson Air Force Base. So Luffy, in creating this Lehulu for me, helps me connect back to my island and to remember that. So there's a story associated with this piece of art. Uh, and so I think that's a, that's a, a way we can, um, right, the story gives life, our heritage gives life to our art. Find the stories of your culture and your people and embody them and let them live through your art. Thank you. Thank you for sharing a beautiful example of art and just the meaning behind it and just sharing with us today. Um, just to make sure we have time for some live Q&A questions, I'll jump into our third question. What are your thoughts on Pacific Islander storytelling, its importance, and how can we further support our fellow artists and storytellers? Dagmar? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to come from a teacher's lens um, and position my reply because I think I'm just passionate about if we get um, in front of this next generation, if we get them to be really strong and empowered, then um, I think in 10, 20 years time, we won't be having these sorts of summits because they would have taken over and <laughs> they'll be showing the world how to do this. So I'm passionate about just starting and getting our foundations right in our schools. So I trust that the truths that I'm going to um, share now will have the ability to cross over and you'll hear that if we get it right with our kids, we're getting it right with us as artists as well. So there's this famous whakatoki, e koro o e ngaro he kakano i rua mai i rangatea. I will never be lost, the seed which was sown from Rangatea. So another way of saying this is my story will survive and go on because it's part of a much bigger story which has an ancient or origin. So as a teacher and as part of our school's localised curriculum, we understand the importance of equipping our students with the skills and confidence to tell our own stories. We do this powerfully through whole school inquiries and through our integrated arts programme. So from a teacher's perspective, storytelling as a pedagogy can be conveyed through conversations and other means of com communication, including the visual. Engaging in storytelling provides students with the opportunity or um, provides artists with the opportunity to share unique experiences. It's an act of exchange and negotiation. The teacher's role is one of providing advice without confining the student's visions. The importance of supporting student voices lies in making room for diversity and awareness. I believe we do this so that children or artists can become more aware and strongly connected to the stories about places and people who have gone before them. That children might imagine or see themselves in their stories, in those stories. That they build stronger identities through their knowledge and security with their connections and connectedness. So they can begin, they can begin to dream up their own stories about who they are and where they are going to end up. That when they become leaders, professionals, mums and dads, teachers, knowledge holders, guides, storytellers, story writers and social actors in the future, they might feel a greater sense of connectedness and groundness in who they are. Ultimately, the chances that those qualities will contribute to a greater awareness, acceptance and celebration of all of our diverse and rich stories is greater if we've become familiar with them when we are young. So the stories that seem to matter to people ultimately aren't perfect or trouble free. They're filled with drama, failure, morality, symbolism, imperfect people, humble beginnings, loss, redemption, weakness and strength consequences, courage, bravery, and cowardice. Any quality that we can think of as part of the human experience or condition, or condition is in a story. Knowing this allows us the full license to stand in our truth and to be bold and, cor and courageous to tell them. Thank you. Thank you. I just reflect on my education. I went to a French high school, actually French education system from kindergarten through 12th grade and hearing what you had to say, just thinking about a world where I could have had an integrated storytelling curriculum where I could learn more about my identity, my culture, my community and feel like I am a piece of art like all of you were saying and that we are all connected in that way. That would have been so empowering. So just to hear your thoughts as an educator and hopefully other educators, not only in the islands, but also part of the diaspora 
Um, if they can hear this, that would be wonderful because that is definitely the direction that we need to go into. We need to start teaching um, scholars at a young age. And you're an are you an elementary teacher? Just want to make sure I got that correct. Um, from five to twelve year olds. So I'm not sure what does that. It's primary here, so I don't know. <laughs> primary intermediate. Yeah, so five to year olds. Yeah. That's incredible. So thank you for the work that you do. We need more people like you. <laughs> Carlo? Yeah, um, I, I guess I just pulling from my, my own experiences of um, growing up um, as a mixed race specific person, um, growing up in Australia, and um, I will say somewhat feeling a little bit disconnected, my Pacific culture and, and languages and lands, um, representation and visibility is so important. Um, and I think that storytelling, um, you know, through film and media is just one way we can um, start to reconnect um, and to pass down not only our ancestral stories, share our present stories and, and to be more visible. Um, the film festival, for example, was pretty much born out of a, a personal search for more Pacifica content um, that I was looking for while, while studying in Australia. And, um, I tried, I was looking for, for stories about people like me, stories not just, um, uh, you know, made about people like me, made by people like me, stories that I could resonate with and identify with, you know, the people that I was looking at, um, not just an outsider's sort of documentary um, made about, um, you know, from an outsider's view. Um, so it was really hard for me to find the stuff that I was after um, while I was studying. And that's kind of where the idea of the festival came from. You know, it's like, oh, imagine if I had if there was this space and there are all these stories and and they were about people like me and, and my community. Um, how cool would that be? And so, you know, down the track, that's where the festival um, came about. Um, and so it was out of a very personal um, need to find representation in the Australian media landscape, um, you know, um, in our libraries and our archives and, and also recognising that if, um, I felt like this, that there's probably a bunch of other people who had similar feelings about, um, you know, their representation and, and, and identity. Um, so, um, yeah, we need to be visible. We need to be heard. We need to be celebrated. Um, and, and our culture and, and our survival depends on it. Um, I think since then, a lot has definitely changed. Um, there are a lot more Pacifica stories, creatives, um, creating and shaking up the media landscape um, in Australia, across the Pacific region um, and across the globe. You know, it's um, it's actually in time. And um, I see Pacifica faces in so many new media projects these days. And it's not just token representation either. It's, um, you know, Pacifica people are owning those spaces. They're, they're the creators, the writers, the directors. Um, it's their voices and, and I think you know, it's their drive. And I think it's a, it's a really, um, it's been a really wonderful thing to watch coming from a place where it was almost felt almost non-existent um, and completely underrepresented you know, under um, to be coming into a space where I'm seeing a lot more ownership um, of those spaces and more representation. I think how we support um, our, 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 our storytellers is what we do, what we do, we come together as, as communities, we, we support one another and we invest in our creators. Um, we watch their work, we share their work, we pay to, to, to you know, see their films or whatever their, their, their creative stuff is. We employ our talent um, and, you know, it's we need to invest back in these and, um, you know, spend money on them, employ them, celebrate them and, um, you know, all jump on board together for this wonderful ride um, sharing our stories. I completely agree. We need to pay our artists, we need to pay our storytellers. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm sure Victoria, you, you may want to chime in on this too. <laughs> um, sure, I mean, I think one of the things that people don't understand about art is that they underestimate the power of art. You know, the saying goes, a picture speaks a thousand words. And um, art can be used not just to, you know, just something pretty to look at. It can tell a story as we've been talking about, it's, you know, it's our form of storytelling. Um, a lot of artists have, a lot of Pacific artists have used their art to, you know, raise awareness on 
particular issues that goes on in, in, in Oceania, like Fruit West Papua. Um, and the thing with art is that it always, the first thing you look at is art is that it catches your attention. And when you look at the art first, that's when you start to dig deeper into like interpreting the meaning behind it. And so I think that's one of the things that um, I want people to understand is that, you know, art is, it's a powerful thing for a lot of artists. It's what allows us to control the narrative. Just as Paulo said, you know, we're not hearing it from someone who's not of our culture. This is us telling our story, no one else. And this is coming from, you know, um, our point of view. It's authentic, it's genuine, it's from our heart, it is our passion. You know, this is what we're trying to give people so that they have a better understanding. Um, one of the best ways to like support artists too is to share their work and when you share it, make sure you give them the credit for it. Because for a lot of, you know, traditional and visual artists, they put in a lot of work, a lot of hours into creating this piece um, for people to look at. And it's, it's sad to see that people would post it without giving them the credit. And that's probably one of the best, it's the simplest way to support someone, to just share and give them the credit for it so that they are recognized for their artwork. Um, also by hosting events like what we'll call Zoom through festivals. You know, we have FestPAC, which was unfortunately canceled this year because of COVID. But FestPAC is, you know, it's been going on throughout Oceania and it, it, it's not just here in Hawaii, but they celebrate it elsewhere where we can take the time to actually appreciate our culture through um, performing art, visual art, and, and so on and so forth. But yeah, th those are my final thoughts on that. Thank you, Victoria. I think it's great that you bring up the artists who are using their art as activism as well. I think it is really powerful and it is beautiful to see our community uh, raising our voices in that way, especially on social media. Now, Mary? Sure. I want to quote a, a fellow Chamorro uh, author and poet, Lee Perez, and she says, there is power in the articulation of thought and sense. There is power in the articulation of thought and sense. Their dialogue can only begin when you find your voice. So I think for many of us, art, uh, storytelling is a path to finding our own voices. For others, it's a journey to using our voices in more powerful ways. And for many, it's a vehicle for giving voice to underprivileged and underrepresented groups. And I think one of the most powerful recent examples I've, I've come across uh, of an artist giving voice to others is um, a young Chamorro, uh, Gisela Charforest McDaniel, uh, Familian uh, Chungi and Kapili are her clans. Uh, I believe her mother, uh, Antoinette, is here. Uh, the subjects of Gisela's work are beautiful portraits of women who have experienced trauma and abuse. Gisela's work with them, interviewing them, working with them, telling their stories through portraiture is about healing, triumph, and the beauty of body and soul. And I think this is uh, one, she's a great role model, but just one of many artists who are doing this, give voice to others. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing. It was really powerful. Now, we have a few minutes. Um, I think we have time maybe for one question. I do want to make sure everyone has the opportunity to share their thoughts. Um, actually, actually, looking at the time, I would rather have everyone go around and share some last words um, since we only have five minutes left to just give everyone at least a minute to share some last words to aspiring uh, artists or storytellers especially if they are in school right now maybe they're undergrads or in university maybe they're not sure if they want to pursue um, an art degree or some sort of uh, degree in film or storytelling any words to those students Dagmar Okay. Um, I'm just trying to picture how I was, you know, just casting back about 30 years when I was in your sit in the same shoes of like choosing or thinking what I wanted to do. But I just knew innately that the arts was the area that I knew I was the most connected to. It was, yeah, where I felt alive. But I, I, 
but it's very different today. I, I can't, don't think we can compare the two two times, uh, two eras of when I, my experience to what's happening today. Um, I would just say, if you're not quite sure, just just have a go, but it don't be hard on yourself if it doesn't fit or maybe try something, um, but just keep trying until you find that thing. Um, it might not happen straight away, but um, eventually if you just keep at it, um, it'll, it'll happen. But yeah, um, I think there's a lot of pressure out there and I think putting more pressure on ourselves to think that you're gonna get it all right right at the start is probably more detrimental than anything. So, um, and sometimes um, I just have to, I, I have a little thing around academ academia because um, that's sort of not really in our sphere either because our arts are enacted in our communities. So it doesn't mean to say you have to go get a degree or anything to be, to be an artist. My son is a self-taught incredible painter and I will not send him to art school. I will not send him to university because it will kill the flame. It'll kill the, the freedom that he has right now. So um, yeah, whilst I think there there is time and place for it, um, I wouldn't put all my eggs in one basket and think that um, a career path just be through the arts, of being a fine artist is, is what you have to do either. Um, that's just my thing from here. I mean, our context is different here in New Zealand as well. So um, I can speak a little bit into what you guys um, are working at, but I don't think it yeah, fits completely. We are quite different down here in the way that we approach things. But yeah. I think people don't hear this enough, what you mentioned that, you know, higher education isn't the only source of success for any career path. And um, while SPIO talks about higher education, that's just one way of achieving your goals. But like you said, if your passion is in the arts, you don't need to feel like you need to adhere to, you know, in, in the US context, at least Western institutions of higher education. And it's really important to, to explore and keep that passion alive. Kahlo? Yeah, um, I mean, I think I would just echo everything Dang Marsak said just then. I agree with, with all of that. I um, never personally had a very strong calling or idea about what I wanted to do. Other, like, what am I going to do when I get to uni? How am I going to know if this is the right thing? But I think for me it was just about um, uh, what do I feel like I'm really good at right now or what am I really enjoying? Um, and going with that feeling of what I want to explore right then and knowing that um, if something changes along the way that that's okay, you know, you, you enjoy that now, you get into that now and you, you explore it and experience and down the track if things change, you, you do something different. It's never, you're not locked in um, forever and whatever skills you pick up, whether it's in the arts or it's in business or in any, any, anything, um, you can apply those, that knowledge anywhere that you go. I find that everything, everything I've done, I can apply in, in different settings and, and it, you're, you're not locked in and everything you just take with you. So you do your arts degree, you do your med degree, you do your law degree. I mean, do it all and um, it'll all serve you very well along the way. So just do what you, in, you enjoy. Thank you, Carlo. Victoria? Um, so, I mean, honestly, I didn't even know I wanted if I wanted to be an artist at this point. I said I was a senior. I failed to mention that I was a super senior, meaning that I've been in university longer than anticipated, but, but that's because I changed my mind and I've changed majors. Before I was into art, I was doing business. So I wanted to own my own business, which is basically what I'm doing now. So you can basically come from entered I'm sorry, my cat is about to get in this way. <laughs> um, you can come from like different, you know, interdisciplinary backgrounds and like still incorporate what you've learned from those and put it all in together in, into your art. Um, it's okay to change your mind, we're human. We're always going to um, come across new things that we'll take interest in and then explore it just to see if we like it or not. Um, and you don't necessarily have to have a degree as you know, like Dagmar said, it, it, it could kill the fire. You know, you just have to be passionate and, you know, um, doing art doesn't necessarily mean you have to have a degree. You can be self-taught. There's so many sources out there, um, absolutely free, um, on YouTube, on Skillshare, or on our page at OAC, where we offer, like, tutorials and workshops for people to just learn how to be, to do art and become an artist and just tell their story. So, yeah. I'm all for this. This is giving me so much life hearing all this. This was 
wisdom. Mary, would you like to take it away? <laughs> sure. Uh, arts and culture, storytelling, all of who we are as Pacific Islanders enriches many professions. Um, in vocational education, think about how your culture and our art forms can inform and improve trades like carpentry, um, fashion, uh, coding. I've got friends who, um, Michael Ceballos, who uh, does place-based, culture-based game coding for kids. Uh, there are other areas like journalism, storytellers. Journalists are storytellers, right? We need more Pacific Islanders in that field so that our stories are out there. Science, indigenous wisdom is coming through the sciences when our people are, are there, right? Studying sciences, getting those degrees, uh, bringing our knowledge forward. Victoria's degree is in Pacific Island studies, right? And her art, um, I think, is probably enriching that program and the people around her uh, in the same way that she's being enriched through that program. So we can change the university by being in the university. Um, if you're in school now, as you're writing your papers, doing your research, put your culture, your arts, our stories into your work. Learn and use indigenous research methodologies. Cite our people, our scholars, our artists, and our authors. Bring our ancient wise sayings, our stories, our art into your work and used arts informed research. There, there are all sorts of methods. Poetry is an ethnographic method as well. So let's get more Pacific Islanders in the academy, decolonize education and the universities, um, whether it's vocational or four year or graduate education. Um, join us, we need you. Uh, and we're, we're, we're here to help you. Well, with that, I would like to thank our wonderful panelists for their insight on pursuing their creative career paths. SPIO hopes to facilitate more open and honest conversations like these on our SPIO Higher Education Network. So if you're a current undergraduate or graduate student and you want to connect with professionals uh, who identify as Pacific Islander, like definitely join. We'll be hosting monthly speaker series on not only navigating higher education, and accessing various, but we'll also be um, looking at accessing various professional industries. So Maruru, thank you for joining us and we hope to see you soon. Bye.